Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining me for these morning devotions. I'm getting, you know, as we have a little bit of time here just before we get started on today's topic and today's passage, I wanted to make a few comments about the approach I've been taking towards spiritual growth. Um, you notice we've been going in with some depth and precision to the issue, and that is not without purpose. That is, I um, really want to be deliberate about how we talk about this. The popular view of spiritual growth today, perhaps in any age, uh, because the sins of, of us manifest in different ways, but the root sins of man are always the same. But anyway, the popular approach to spiritual growth is woefully shallow, and th that approach is this. Tell me the blessings that I can get from God, and tell me what I need to do in order to get them. Tell me what God can give me, tell me what I need to do to get them. That is, I wouldn't say hopelessly shallow. There's always hope, because Christ is still living, His Spirit is still active, His Word still has power. But that is desperately and painfully shallow. That's religion. That is sinful man's approach at religion, trying to get to God by being good, doing good works. And so I'm really trying to go out of my way to avoid and to help us all overcome the shallowness of that popular approach of just tell me what I can get and tell me what I need to do, need to do in order to get it. And so that's why I've been taking um, time to go into these different aspects of spiritual growth. Okay, so that's enough banter to introduce. Welcome, everyone. Morning devotion. So thankful that you joined me on this. We have a small crew, but a faithful crew, and I appreciate you tuning in. Today we're talking about the problem of spiritual growth. The problem of spiritual growth. We've been talking about growth, but there's a huge problem underneath this topic. It's this. You cannot have spiritual growth unless you first have spiritual life. You cannot have growth unless you first have the presence of of life. Ephesians 2.1. The Apostle Paul there is talking to Christians and he's referring them and reminding them of where they came from, what they were, who they were, but what they were and how they lived before Christ. Ephesians 2.1. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. You were dead in trespasses and sins. That's the topic we're looking at today. And We'll actually, we'll, uh, through the whole thing, end up reading Ephesians 2, 1, all the way through 10. But first, a review. First, a review. Do this quickly, but it's important. I want to keep this in context. First, we looked at the paradigm of spiritual growth. The paradigm is an overarching way that you look at something or an overarching way that you think about something. The paradigm for spiritual growth is seeing Christ by faith. And being transformed by His Spirit into His likeness. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And we all, with unveiled face, right, unveiled. So, veil, can't see, unveiled, can see. We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord. And in the context, that's beholding the glory of Christ in heaven through the gospel. We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord who is spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.18 is probably the best verse that summarizes this paradigm for spiritual growth. We see Christ by faith. We're transformed by the power of his spirit to be more like him. That begins with repentance and faith, turning to Christ and trusting in Christ, and it continues with repentance in Christ, continuing to turn to look to Him in faith. We looked at the paradigm of spiritual growth, then we looked at the manifestation of spiritual growth. What does that look like in my life as I'm seeing Christ by faith and being transformed by His Spirit to be more like Him? Love and obedience. Love and obedience. There's so much more you could say about what spiritual growth looks like, joy, hope, peace, patience, all kinds of things, but at the root of it is a love for God and an obedience to God. John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The paradigm of spiritual growth, seeing Christ by faith and being transformed to be, to be more like Him by the power of His Spirit. The manifestation of spiritual growth, what does that look like? 
It grows in love and obedience. And then last week we looked at the heart of spiritual growth. Really just trying to narrow this down into a nutshell um, in terms of how we see Christ by faith. The center of that is the gospel, right? Who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and what Jesus provides for sinners. But even trying to put all of that into one category, and here's what we said is the heart of spiritual growth, is seeing God's gracious and merciful love for sinners. Is seeing God's gracious and merciful love for sinners. Hearing about that love in the gospel. Reading about that love in scripture. Praying that God would show me that love by his spirit. Seeing his gracious and merciful love for sinners. And of course, all of that is revealed in and received in the Lord Jesus Christ by virtue of his life, death, resurrection. 1 John 4.10 Now this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. It's raising the issue of what initiated this love of God. Did our love for God initiate and activate his love for us? Heavens, no, that could never be. If that were the case, God would never have this redemptive love for us. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation, an atoning sacrifice. A blood sacrifice that turns away the wrath of God by absorbing that wrath of God in our place. Now, all, all of that is background and review. Now, today, the problem of spiritual growth you cannot have spiritual growth unless you first have spiritual life. Ephesians 2.1 You were dead in trespasses and sins. Spiritually dead means the absence of spiritual life. Being spiritually dead means the absence of spiritual life. Just like being physically dead means the absence of physical life. And of course, so, uh, uh, in the context of everything that we've been talking about, the spiritual life is found in Christ. If you picture a crop that is scorched and dies. It has no growth, there will be no growth, and it will yield no fruit. Death is the absence of life, and anything else that could come from life. If there's no life, there's no growth, and there's no fruit. And notice the strength of the metaphor in Ephesians 2.1. Dead. Not asleep spiritually, not passed out or in a coma spiritually. Not injured or crippled spiritually. Spiritually dead. There's an entire sermon that could be preached here on the, different, on the different aspects of this. What I want to do is give you a quick three points of what it means to be spiritually dead. And then we'll read verses 2 and 3. And you'll see them come up out of the text. Uh, being spiritually dead means personal guilt before God. It means inward corruption, and it means outward disobedience. It means there's a personal guilt. There's a standing before God that I am guilty before Him. There's an inward corruption, a corruption of the heart, sinfulness of the heart, and there's an outward disobedience. Uh, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. And that's what we're talking about, being spiritually dead. Dead in trespasses and sins. Trespasses is violating God's holiness. Personal guilt. Verse 2, in which you once walked, following the course of this world. Following the prince of the power of the air. Outward disobedience. Outward disobedience, in which you once walked. And then there's a comma right there. And he... And he Ends verse 2 by saying this. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. In. There's a spirit of disobedience and sin at work in the sons of disobedience. And his point to them is that used to be you. This spirit used to be at work in you. Inward corruption. So you see there's personal guilt. Inward corruption. Outward disobedience. Verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Inward, right? In, there's an outward problem, there's an inward problem. And were by nature children of wrath like the rest 
of mankind. Spiritual death that includes personal guilt, inward corruption, and outward disobedience. And you could even put all of that under one category because the spiritual death is the reality, but that's expressing the reality through a metaphor, the metaphor of death. It's being alienated from God and hostile to Him. Being spiritually alienated from God and hostile to Him. And it manifests, and, it, it, and you see it, it's evidenced in personal guilt, inward corruption, and outward disobedience. Spiritually dead. That's the problem of spiritual growth. That's the problem that needs to be remedied. What is the remedy? Well, if the problem is death, the remedy is life. The remedy is life. Look at verse 4. But God... Being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Now that's the remedy. Is God making spiritually dead sinners alive with Christ? The remedy is something that God does. The remedy is something that only God can provide. This is a supernatural work of God to make spiritually dead sinners alive. Alive in Christ. That's why it's the first thing he says after he uh, catalogs the different aspects of what it means to be spiritually dead. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the, the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. If this is not of your own doing, this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship it's almost like paul's running out of ways to express you didn't do this you couldn't do this only god could do it he just keeps saying it in different ways by grace you've been saved by grace you've been saved it's the gift of god it's not a result of works it's not of your own doing you are his workmanship and then he gives us another one created in christ jesus being made alive is an act of creation created in christ jesus for good works which god prepared beforehand that we should walk in them so the personal guilt is remedied in Christ as he forgives our sins, removes our guilt, and gives us the righteousness of Christ. The inward corruption is also remedied in Christ as he purifies us and sanctifies us in heart, gives us a new nature, renews our mind, gives us a new heart. And also the outward disobedience is remedied in Christ as with new hearts and justified before God with all of our sin and guilt taken away, uh, we have a new walk. In fact, Chapter 2, verse 1, you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, verse 2. And at the end of this passage, um, the very last thing he says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he begins with one kind of walk. He ends with another kind of walk. And right in the middle is God making us alive in Christ. So all these different aspects that we listed, those, those three aspects of spiritual death, every single one of them is remedied in Christ. John 3.3, 3, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We must be born again. We must be born again in Christ. John 10, 10 and 11, the, the end of verse 10 into 11, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus preaching about his own death, talking about his, his death that was to come just a short while after that. And um, he, Jesus laying down his life is the central act by which he provides life for us. Verse John 5, verse 11. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Eternal life. Eternal life. When we say spiritual life, we mean life in Christ. We mean the life of the Spirit within us. We mean eternal life. Knowing God. Knowing Jesus Christ whom He has sent. 
knowing the Holy Spirit and having the Holy Spirit within us. This is eternal life. It's the remedy to this problem of spiritual growth that you cannot have spiritual growth unless you first have spiritual life. You cannot have spiritual life unless you come to the Lord Jesus Christ for that life in faith and repentance. I want us to feel helpless. God in Scripture reveals that He wants us to feel helpless and hopeless um, in relation to any effort apart from Christ to have life. Any effort, any good work, any religion, any philosophy that's apart from Christ that we would use as a source of spiritual life or growth, we need to surrender that and drop it and let it go and seek Christ and Christ alone, the only source of spiritual growth. Life is in Jesus. Jesus provides life. He's the only remedy for spiritual death. Thank you for joining. I'd like to invite you um, on Wednesday, 6.30 to 6.50. We have a time of congregational prayer on our go-to meeting platform. If you don't know what any of that means, just go to our website. you find that on our Facebook page. And um, the access code is there. And then also on Wednesday, back on the live stream, Pastor John and I will be in the study at 7 p.m. Wednesday evening going through 1 Peter verse by verse, thought by thought, application by application. God bless you. Have a blessed Monday, and I will see you soon.